Okay. Yeah. I wish that we would have bought food from one of the little stands. Our guy did. Idea. And whatever um, like little wrap she got looked so good. Hello and welcome to the Worldwide Honeymoon Travel Podcast, the podcast that talks about all things couples travel, including destinations, tips, advice, and more. I'm Kat. I'm Chris. And this is episode number 202. This is going to provide some great motivation for you to choose a snowy winter hike this weekend. Oh yeah, that's right. That's going to... We don't have to get up at the crack of dawn for that, do we? Yes, we do. No, we do not. Yeah. We it's have... winter. Nobody's hiking in the park in winter. We have to see the sunrise. No, we do not. <laughs> I see it su- rise every day when I take you into work <laughs> and when I get up early to work out during the week. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so we are now still talking about St. Lucia, dreaming about St. Lucia, especially as the weather is cold here. Um definitely missing those warm, warm days. Um, And yeah, before we get into today's topic, what's been going on? Well, um, you cooked up a storm and threw a fantastic um, holiday party. Yeah, belated holiday party. Belated holiday party. (laughs) Um, And I mean, you you had great food. Catherine makes this focaccia bread that is divine it is absolutely perfect thank you thank you it is i mean it really is like i don't i don't order focaccia bread when we go out to restaurants Mm -hmm. because i know it's always going to fall short of yours i mean i would imagine in italy it would be pretty good it was not as good as yours we didn't have focaccia in italy i could tell by the optics and it didn't have that little like that you can like scratch on the bottom I like a good, hard, crispy texture on the bottom of my focaccia. Always have, always will. Okay. And it's like akin to pan pizza in that way. You know, like mm-hmm. when you flip over a slice of pan pizza and you can scratch and go like, Ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-ch. you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yours has that every time. But then it's nice and chewy when you bite into it. Oh my gosh, We got to use good? bread flour for starters. It has more gluten content, which gives it that chew. It's just so good. And then you put good. about three quarters of a cup of olive oil in the bread throughout the process. So it definitely gives it that uh, nice little crispy back part. Very, very good. Yeah. I always enjoy your focaccia. Um, but yeah, we, we did that. We got together with family to celebrate my sister's birthday, which was also a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a delicious oatmeal cream pie, like homemade oatmeal cream pie. Not homemade, store like restaurant made. Yeah, but not prepackaged. Yeah, um, that was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, we yeah finally took down our Christmas decorations. That we had be them my up highlight. for almost two months, so that was certainly a good thing to finally get taken down. Uh, yeah, because we put them up around mid November. Um, oh yeah, the Christmas sheets are still on our guest bedroom bed, but I'm taking those down tomorrow when I wash them. Don't worry, Christopher. He was literally pointing at the Christmas sheets while I was like, yeah, we finally took everything down. Yep. Yeah. Um, I always miss it because I do love our place at Christmas, but I also love having a little bit more space Mm -hmm. that isn't taken up. Like we have a pretty big tree. It's as wide as I am tall. We go all out. It... (laughs) It is more than four feet wide. Stop it. No, it's like I'm 5'4". And, and I, it's 5'4 wide? I literally think it's 5'4 wide, yeah. You know? It takes up a lot of space. And it's like an eight foot tall tree, so. I'm not going to bore everyone with this, but I'm fairly certain that there is a way to figure out like the volume of the tree if we are going to treat it as a cone. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I believe that. There is a pretty simple formula for that. That's geometry. Yeah. But we'll get into that in a future episode. Okay. Um, Got to dig out the, the high school geometry. Uh, some of us took that course in middle school. Okay. You know what I mean. Eighth grade geometry. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Did you guys do proofs in geometry? Yes. Do you remember those? Yes. Okay. This, this ought is, to be good. This is really weird. Um. Yeah. I mean, I 
went to a high school that was very, very tiny in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. And um, we actually went through three geometry teachers. In one semester? In like one year. Or no, it was one. Yeah. No, it was in a whole year. We went through three geometry teachers. Um, yeah. And like. For what reasons? Like nefarious reasons? I think or? one one person was there and then he just like disappeared and never came back to work. Hold on. Like. Let's start with this one. Yeah. Is this person okay? Like were there. I think he's. Yeah. He's, he's alive. He just like dipped out and like never came back. And we were like, cool, man. Um, and, and as you can imagine, being a smaller school, um, it is kind of harder to find teachers that want to live in a tiny town kind of in the middle of nowhere and be a teacher and not get paid very much. So like it can be pretty hard to find staffing there. And um, so he just dipped out and disappeared. In he, the middle of a semester? Yes. What about the children? It was only like two months in. Um, and did he what like? Did this person like legit know what they were doing or were they like, I am in way over my head with I geometry? I really, they didn't really like tell us all of this stuff. I mean, he's a math teacher. I would imagine he knows what he's doing with geometry. Um, I huh. think it's like. That's an assumption. But I will say that like there were some like very misbehaved children like in my class at times and they would be a lot to handle. What did you do? I didn't do anything. I was the star child. Oh my god! <laughs> but like. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, like, so he just, like, dipped out, dropped off the face of the earth. Everyone was like, w- we don't know. Yeah, we um, don't know if our proofs are correct. No, exactly. This was when we were trying to learn proofs. And then we got, like... I loved proofs. Then we got another teacher, and, like, she also left for whatever reason, but she, like, we knew she was, like, she, like, announced her departure. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure she pushed one of the kids because he was being really bad pushed a child i don't yeah i mean we were like 15 but there were some unruly kids in my class you gotta um, draw a hard line yeah and then the last one was a substitute teacher so like he was doing his best but like he didn't get like a full-on degree in mathematics or anything to like do this man so like i'll be honest geometry is not a strong subject for me because i and probably for everyone that was there at that school during that semester and that whole year because like we had a various teachers teaching various things and like I never we learned proofs like very very little because it was happening during all of this like time of transition. Oh my gosh, we had almost like an entire year of proofs. Yeah, no that. And I'm pretty sure it was 10th grade when we learned geometry. 10th grade? Yeah. What maths did I you I mean do? we we learned When did you take not, algebra? Algebra was 9th grade. Okay. We started it the more advanced students like we started that in 8th grade a little bit in okay. our math class but then it went more like into algebra and then algebra two was in 10th grade. Wow. Yeah. I thought geometry was in 10th grade. We also had that too. Oh, you didn't even have a full year. Well, I <laughs> with the staffing issues. Well, you um, know, like high school, you have like all this different stuff that you have to take. Right. You. Anyway. What um, was your highlight of the week? Okay. Highlight was the Christmas party that I threw. Um, what was yours? Mine was your focaccia. Okay. Just anytime, that. you know, anytime you make the focaccia bread, I think it's always going to be my highlight. Um, it's great now because we have the KitchenAid mixer, so I don't have to work like kneading this dough for like 30 minutes straight and getting an arm workout and sweating. Um, I can just throw it in the mixer and it makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> All I heard were three words, expect more focaccia. Okay. So I'm very excited about that. Okay. But let's get into, speaking of volume and uh, conical conical things um when we were in saint lucia there were quite a few conical mountains called the pitons the petit piton and the gross piton and we did hike the gross piton and so today we're going to give you a little insight about hiking in saint lucia before we talk about gross piton and petit piton because those are two of the more famous or well-known hikes why don't you quickly chat about the tet paul nature trail which I would not say is in the same class as the uh, the Piton hikes. Do we want to go like easiest to most challenging? Sure, I, we, we can do that. We have four hikes that we're going to do. They're four most popular hikes. If you're in St. Lucia, you can hire a guide for this. Um, some you can do on your own, etc. Let's do that. But let's kick it off with the easiest one. Um, this one's very popular, especially for honeymooners. And that's the Tetpal Nature Trail. 
it's a little over a half mile total. It's a loop trail. It's pretty flat. I think it takes, I mean, it's less than an hour. I think it's even less than 30 minutes to do unless you stop for photos. Um, only 134 feet in elevation gain. Um, and the best part, you do need a guide for it, which you can get when you get there. Um, or you could just book it through a resort or whatever that you're staying at. What is the reason that you need a guide? I don't know if it's just for conservation. Make sure you don't go off trail, that Maybe sort of that thing. Maybe that sort of thing. Because yeah. there's a lot of trails here that like the Gros Piton, you had to go with the guide, this sort of thing. So you do need a guide. Okay. Um, But this is such a great hike for like very little effort for some great payoff. Um, the views are amazing. You can see both pitons without hiking crazy, crazy amounts, uh, to do so. And, um, it's very popular with honeymooners because it's just a very scenic, beautiful route. It's pretty easy. You can talk and, and connect and see these beautiful views. So while it says, oh, it'll only take 20 minutes if you just hike it straight, you're probably going to stop and take photos and enjoy the views and things like that. So the Tetpal Nature Trail, it is near, um, it isn't too far from the Gros Piton and P Petit Piton hike. So it's kind of near Sioux Frères, that area uh, where you'll stay to catch that hike. So beautiful little hike. It's not going to take you very long, but a lot of reward for very little, um, like effort, I guess, to do so. Um, so it's also great for families, honeymooners, all that sort of stuff. Great. Yeah. And we did not do this hike. We did not because we didn't have the time to do it. But if we did, I would have loved to have seen it. Um, again, it's an easy hike. It's just an easy go do it in the morning and then come back and hang out on the beach the rest of the day. And you got to hike and see some beautiful views, you know. Um, but yeah, so the next hike is um, a more moderate hike. And that is the Fort Rodney and Signal Hill hike. Now, that is actually up near Castries. So if you're coming in on a cruise ship, that is where the cruises will come into, is to the main capital of St. Lucia, so Castries. Um, and this is in... Sorry? S sorry, just to quickly like give some geography here. So Castries and this hike are in the northern part of the island. Yes. And then um, the remaining three hikes, the Tetpal Nature Trail and the Gros Piton and Petit Piton are near Soufrere, which are in the southwestern part of the island. Yeah. So this is a different part of the island, northern part. Um, this is also in Pigeon Island National Park, which is a highlight to go see, especially if you are in Castries. Um, fantastic views of the Caribbean, of the just the area and the mountains of St. Lucia. It's 288 feet in elevation gain. So again, not too terribly difficult. I've heard there's maybe a scramble or two, but nothing like nothing significant to um, to make this a very challenging hike. Takes about an hour to complete, especially if you want to stop for photos, maybe budget a little bit longer of time. Um, and this is a moderate hike of about one and a half miles. So again, another great trail that if you don't want to like work up too huge of a sweat and climb up a literal mountain, um, this is a great one that you'll get lots of great views and it's not quite as challenging. It's an out and back trail as well. So you're going to enjoy the Fort Rodney and Signal Hill trail. So... Just real quick before we go on to the two pitons, mm -hmm. are either of these two hikes things that you wish that we would have like swapped something out for? Are they reason enough to go back to St. Lucia? Like, what are you, what are you thinking? And this is just like purely personal, right? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't swap them out for anything. I'm glad we did what we did, but, okay. um, I will say that if we had more time, I probably, I would have liked to have seen these. Both of them? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if we had an extra day in Sioux Frere, we probably would have gone to Sugar Beach and snorkeled in the afternoon and did that in the morning. Like, it takes well, hardly any time to do the Tetpal Nature Trail. Maybe. Okay. And then I kind of want to, I wouldn't mind going back to St. Lucia to see the northern part of the island and see more of the Caribbean. Yeah, the beaches, absolutely. Uh, which would include going to Pigeon Island National Park. All right. Let's talk about the third uh, or the third one is going to be one of the more challenging hikes. This is the one we did. And do you want to talk about the Gros Piton? Sure. Before we talk about the climb, um, do you have the statistics on, I think it was about 3.8 miles. It was slightly less than four miles, mm -hmm. right around 1,700 feet of elevation gain mm -hmm. or slightly below about 600 meters of elevation gain. Is that right? Yes. And the elevation of Gros Piton is 2,600 and I think 19 feet, if I can um, read my handwriting. Or about 771 meters. So it is the tallest of the pitons, uh, hence the gross piton. Um, but yeah, and it took us about 
three and a half hours to complete? Yes, three and a half hours total, um, under three hours of moving time, I will say. And the reason why I split it up that way is because there are um, four different uh, spots that you're going to stop at. Mm-hmm. So the first is about the the quarter mark. And you actually start by walking through a village with some um, stands that are selling food or beverages or piton beer. And make sure you um, have a lot of water. Yes. For this. Um, I actually bought some water before at this little village beforehand. Yes. And they, there's a place to go to the bathroom, which I highly recommend doing before you go on your hike. There is. They recommend about two liters of water per person mm-hmm. um, for the hike. And they also have hiking poles or um, like trekking poles that they are offering for rental for $5. Mm-hmm. Um, Kat decided to rent one. I did not decide to rent one. Um, but that was just like purely a personal choice. Yeah. Um, but you, you start walking through the, the tiny, um, village and then you get to the, um, actual trail and start hiking up. And really you are hiking up the entire time. Mm-hmm. It's like um, Table Mountain on steroids. I felt like. I thought Table Mountain was much harder. No, I thought Table, I think Table Mountain was harder because it was, it was warm, but we had no um, cover like you know at least with this trail you're mostly underneath the trees in the forest kind of going up the mountain um there is no cover like there's no shade when you're doing table mountain at least the uh is it platycliff gorge yes uh, or cataclip or pataclip i can't remember there's uh, a gorge there's a gorge that you hike through and it's there's no cloud cover uh or no cover it was a sunny day when we went we didn't bring enough water a lot of factors there that really made it challenging uh, for the hike. So I think had we been better prepared, it wouldn't have been as bad. Okay. But yeah, I think Gross Piton was harder as okay. far as like the actual technicality and climbing up. So when we get to the end of it, I was going to actually start like going through some of the past hikes we've done to see if you think it's harder or easier, just because I know that you've had um, listeners and readers contact you and say that they've done some of the hikes that we've mentioned or that we've done. So mm-hmm. just to kind of like give people a um, sort of a, gauge. a taste of where it's at. Yeah. yeah. And this um, is based upon our, our personal experience and our fitness levels, too. It took us three and a half hours. Um, some, some people do it in less time. Some people do it in slower amount of time. I'd say we were pretty average if not a little bit faster yeah i think Um, that that's right yeah because we passed a few people on the way up um but yeah but so you're hiking through the village you you hike the first 25 percent, and you get to a pretty neat um lookout point where you'll stop have some water all of that good stuff um keep views of the caribbean yes views of the caribbean you keep hiking up and this is actually in my opinion the best view of the entire hike you're at the halfway point and you have this gorgeous view of Petit Piton. Mm-hmm. Um, from the 50% point up to the 75% point, the 75%, three quarters of the way up, you're going to stop near a mango tree that is over 300 years old. Yeah, and this is pretty much all in the forest. You're just straight up hiking. All uphill, mm-hmm. all technical. Mm-hmm. Um, they do have, at many points throughout the hike... Um, I'll call them like railings or banisters made of um, branches, mm-hmm. which are are very helpful. Um, but yeah, your your quads and your hamstrings and your glutes and everything are going to uh, going to be sore mm-hmm. with this hike. Um, and then from the seventy five percent up to the top, um, again all uphill, right? Um, but I didn't think that that was as bad as the halfway to three quarters mark. Um, but once yeah. you're at the top. You have gorgeous views of the island. Um, on clear days, you can see St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You can see Martinique. Um, it was a little hazy further out on the day we were up there, so we actually didn't get to see those. But we saw tons of um, villages. Mountains. Um, mountains. The sea. Yeah, it was gorgeous. The one thing that was missing from the summit, and maybe this is on me, maybe I didn't look in the right direction, but I think I looked all around, was Petit Piton. Yeah, you don't see that from the summit. You see, because I think you're on the other side of the mountain at that point. Yes. Um, you see Petit Piton from the halfway point. So there are actually a lot of people that just hike to the halfway point and back. That's totally fine. There were some people we saw that only hiked to the quarter part and back. Because um, it is quite challenging and it is technical. I mean, it is a lot of like using rock-like stairs 
Yes. Um, which can be a lot, especially if you are not a big experienced hiker or anything. So definitely, um, yeah, if you only want to do the halfway point and turn around, honestly, that was the best part. More power to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say that if you are hiking for views, you're either going 25%, 50%, or 100%. -hmm. You're not going to stop at 75 and turn around. Look at this mango tree. Right, (laughs) right. Um, And like I said, I mean, my favorite view was the was the halfway point of Petit Piton. Yeah. And um, you do have to have a guide for this hike. It's $50 for the guide, or you can book it through your resort and they'll arrange all of that for you. Um, the last hike goes out at two o'clock in the afternoon because they do shut it down, I think around six. Um, and the first hike is between seven and eight in the morning. So um, I recommend earlier in the day to get before the uh, sun gets way up in the sky and gets super hot. So in the cool of the morning. Yeah. Um, And I will say, as far as the quarters go, I feel like the first quarter was challenging because you start going uphill and you're, you know, you know, when you first start a cardio cardio workout and you're like, oh, what's this? The second part, um, like your heart kind of has to catch up. And then the second part um, was actually a lot easier to get to the halfway point because you're, you're kind of used to that elevation and all of that stuff that you're doing. Then it was the three quarters part to get to the three quarters. Um, that part is again, another challenge because it is just straight uphill and you're, again, your body's like, what is happening to me? And then finally the last bit, you start getting used to it again. And then you make it to the top and you're also like, okay, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. It's only like 20 minutes left. Um, and then you make it to the top and then coming down, um, is far easier breath wise and cardio wise, but it is a struggle with your like lower body. So if you have knee problems, be careful wrap up that knee or something. Um, and that's where the pole comes in handy too, having a hiking pole coming down the mountain because yes. it can be rougher on your knees. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Cause you're climbing back down. It's an out and back. So you're coming right back down the way you came and that can be a challenge. I thought it was more technically challenging, making sure you don't slip and fall during that. I thought coming down was far harder than coming up or going up rather. I definitely think going up was harder. Um, because it was like really challenging your muscles, especially when I have short legs. So it was a lot of like really stepping up high. Yeah. Um, so you're really using your leg muscles and stuff. Um, but coming down is definitely a challenge in its own way. Like you think, oh, like most of the time if you go up a mountain and you climb back down, it takes like 30 minutes to get down, but like two hours to get up. Sure. This is like two hours to get up and you still take like an hour and a half to get down because sure. it's quite a, it's quite a, you maybe don't have to stop and take breaks as much because you're not like out of breath or anything, but you uh, you do want to be careful getting down the mountain, especially if it's raining. Yes. Or like a, or it had rained or something. Yes. That's even more treacherous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about like where it um, where it compares. So okay. both of us agree that halfway point was the best view, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Both of us are happy that we did the hike. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. Let's Stowe Pinnacle in Stowe, Vermont. Do you think that Gros Piton or Stowe Pinnacle was more challenging? Uh, Gros Piton. Agreed. How about Mount Killington in Killington, Vermont? Uh, Gros Piton. I thought was harder than I anything agree. we did in Vermont. Yeah. I agree. What about Mount Camerer in Great Smoky Mountain National Park? You know, I think I'm going to go with Gros Piton being harder because Mount Camerer... I think it was really only challenging for like the first hour and it was relentless uphill. It wasn't quite as like picking your leg up and like pushing yourself up quite like a stair step. It was more like a constant uphill steepness. Okay. But then you also hit this mar- mile marker part where it was mostly flat when you got on the Appalachian Trail. Agreed. So I would say, yeah, Petit Pit- or Gross Piton was harder in okay. that regard. Um, what about the... Oh my gosh, why am I blanking on the name? Where is it? The long hike in Glacier that we did. Um, That full hike? Is that I the Highline Trail? Th- uh, To Granite Park Chalet or Granite? Yes. Yeah. That hike overall, I think, was easier than Petit P- or Gross Piton, except for when we went to the Glacier Lookout. That, that was only like a 0.9 mile, but it was like 900 feet in elevation gain or something. Yes. That was extremely difficult because not only are you dealing with the very sharp increase in elevation, but um, you're also at elevation, like a pretty high elevation. So you're kind of dealing with like altitude as well as like 
a very high incline, so it's a little bit harder to catch your breath than it would be versus gross piton. So okay. I'd say that portion, ver- that was definitely a lot harder than petite piton. Like I would take or a few gross steps. Piton. Yeah, because gross piton, like, yes, I would be like kind of like breathing heavy and stuff, but it wasn't like, oh, I take two steps and I need to stop and catch my breath quite like the like Grinnell Glacier, the Grinnell Glacier Overlook Trail because of okay. the altitude. Yeah. What about... Um, you said that you thought the Gross Piton was harder than Table Mountain. I disagreed. Okay. Um, what about Rainbow Mountain? Rainbow Mountain was definitely harder. I, I mean, agree you're with you're that. at like fifteen thousand feet in elevation. It's not it's not even like the technicality of the trail that made it harder. And it, it literally the only reason why Rainbow Mountain is harder because it wasn't like I think technicality Gross Piton obviously, but. Again, you're at 15,000 feet in elevation, so your body is trying to compensate for that. So it would there would be times we'd be going uphill, take one or two steps, and we'd have to stop and catch our breath yes. on Petit or on um, Rainbow Mountain because of the altitude. Yes. Yeah. So I I did not <clears> – <throat> excuse me. I did not think that Gross Piton was, like, terribly challenging. Mm-hmm. I think one of the challenging things for me is that I couldn't get momentum, if that makes sense. Like, I couldn't um, – because, like, I have longer legs, yeah. you have shorter legs, and our guide had shorter legs. Yeah. So I couldn't necessarily go, like, at the pace that I wanted to all the time. Um, and that was a little challenging. But overall, I think it was a definitely a challenging hike. But it wasn't something where um, I would say that you had to have, like, extensive experience or what have you to do it. Like, if you're if you're comfortable hiking um, and you've done some some hiking up um, I'll say peaks mm-hmm. right not like neighborhood walking or something like well, I'd that say if you've done like day hikes before yeah like up mountains like in the Smokies or Shenandoah you'll be that, absolutely fine you'll be fine um, yeah you're gonna probably have to stop and take breaks yes that's just I mean you're gonna have to it's a big mountain like it's a good it's a good amount of elevation gain and it's warm outside so you're burning up and yeah you you need to drink water and take breaks and catch your breath because it literally is going straight up a mountain like you're not like right steadily inclined it's like it's going up there quickly so both of us said that it was definitely worth doing if you go back to St. Lucia is it on your list no I mean, I've done it. I would maybe go to the halfway point because I just don't feel the need to go all the way back to the top. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. What about you? Um, I don't think that I necessarily would do it again. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because of what we're going to talk about next. But um, is there anything you would have changed about the hike? Um, Maybe starting earlier in the day. Okay. Yeah. I wish that we would have bought food from one of the little stands our guy did idea. and whatever um like little wrap she got looked so good well and other people on the top of the mountain were eating too they had snacks that they brought with them we brought zero food i also um wish that we had brought a piton beer i don't know I if don't, you can i don't know if you can but i also feel like if you can you still I'm, have to go back down the mountain and it can be quite treacherous like even in great weather and being sober so i can't fair. imagine after a beer when like you haven't had much to eat because you've been burning all of this so you're gonna get you know it's gonna go to your head a lot quicker and then you have to climb down a mountain and it's gonna dehydrate you faster and it's really hot outside so probably not a good idea but i do wish that we had brought some sort of snacks Agreed. And I will only preface that by saying that if it's allowed, yeah, I would have. No, no, I would have had one at the top. I maybe would have had a sip, but I just, Eh. I don't think coming back down would have been my worry. (laughs) So the reason that I would not do it again is because if I'm going to go back to St. Lucia and do a hike, I'm doing this next one. And what is the final one that we're talking about? All right, the hardest one is Petit Piton. And even though it's smaller, it's it's 2,425 feet in elevation. So it's only about 200 feet shorter than Gros Piton. It's the harder of the Piton hikes. It actually, and it gets less traffic than the Gros Piton. Um, yeah, and it's only about a mile each way. So two miles, you think, oh, that's not that bad. Um, you know, I used to think that the distance wouldn't be a big deal. And then I hiked up to Grinnell Glacier Overlook Trail and realized how much of an elevation gain you can get in like less than a mile. And I was like, whoo, baby. Um, yeah. So never, never be fooled by the uh, the small, the shorter hikes. 
um, especially when you're gaining about 1,250 feet in elevation. And that's going all the way up, and which is higher than Grinnell Glacier Overlook. Yeah. Which is a bigger elevation gain. I mean, again, you're not at a high altitude, so you're not dealing with like altitude sickness and stuff, but sure. still very, very challenging. Um, they do recommend having a guide. You do not need a guide to do it, so it's just kind of at your own risk. And it is an out and back trail. Um, and uh, yeah, it takes about four hours to com- complete, so even longer than Gross Beton. So this was, there's there's some discrepancy on all trails, I will say, and yeah. some of the people that we talked to. So no one that we talked to hiked Petit Piton, yeah. other than this family from Wisconsin that we met. Mm-hmm. So shout out to Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, but everyone that we talked to, I mean, even when we said like, oh, we like hiked Gross Piton, there were a lot of people that were like, why would you do that? And but it's then like, we well, met some fun. people that are like, oh, I've hiked it once or twice or something. Like locals. Yeah. I feel like the locals like try to hike it's a it one once. And done. It's like a yeah. one and done. They've done it, except for the like people that are the guides that do it sometimes multiple times a day, which is insane. But, yes. Yeah. But Petit Piton, um, there is not a ropes course. But there are ropes that you will have to use, utilize some upper body strength for a scramble. There is a rabbit hole at the top, which is like a tighter rock formation that you would have to squeeze through. Um, it It's more technical. Yeah. Um, it's, it's going to be more challenging. We did not do Petit Piton. Before we went to St. Lucia, we were kicking back and forth the idea of doing Gros Piton or Petit Piton. Mm-hmm. Um, we decided on Gros Piton. Um, and I'm glad that we did because again, like it's kind of like I, I attribute it to, um, kind of like the, like why I'm not terribly interested in dining in the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Mm-hmm. When you think of Paris, you think of the Eiffel Tower and you can't see it as part of the view if you're in it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like if you're yeah. hiking Petit Piton, you're not going to be able to see Petit Piton, but you can see Gros Piton theoretically. Yeah. Um, I do think that it does have better views from the top. Yes. That's what I've heard. Yes. So, that's So, nice. um yeah, I would I would absolutely do this. If we went back, I would I would want to do this. I would want to give like maybe like some advance warning. I have the upper body strength of a third grader. Like I'm just not a um I can run for like miles, mm-hmm. but I'm not a uh I'm not a uh, muscular dude um in in the upper body region. So, Using yeah. like the ropes and all of that would probably, um, that would probably be the biggest challenge for me. And it would have to be like on a nice day. Like I could not do it on a rainy day. Like no, you did that would with be old tough. Rag. That would be really tough and dangerous. Yeah. And even in the reviews of Petit Piton, there are people that are like, there's a couple of places where like if you fell, like that's it. And uh, I will. So you do have to be careful. And I think actually having a guide is a good idea. Like hiring someone to help you with that because they know more, you know? So from what I've read, it's it's nearly impossible to walk off the trail. Okay. It's a it's a well marked trail. You're not oh, gonna you mean like getting lost. Right. Yeah. You're not gonna get lost. Um also if you have a fear of heights, there is thick underbrush on the side. So there, it's not like you're looking straight down into like the ocean mm-hmm. or something like that, right? Or or the sea, I should say. Um but the the other reason for a guide is that if you go through all trails, you'll see that some people were like, oh, it was $30. Oh, it was $50. Like, and then there was someone that was like, this isn't like, there's no entrance fee. And I just told the guy that and he was like, ah, you got me. So like, if you have a guide, they can probably navigate that a little bit easier depending upon your comfort level of like um, bartering or what have you. Well, and I also think it's nice to like have an experienced guide who's done this before so they can kind of, so so you won't get lost or they can kind of help you navigate like how to get through certain areas and stuff too. So sure. I think that's always a good idea um, to have a guide probably for a hike like that. Agreed. Yeah. If we went back, is this something that you have any interest in doing or is this more of a, I'm going to sleep in, you have fun and we will catch up at lunch? No, I I would do it. I would probably be a one and done thing. Like okay, um, yeah, because I like to challenge myself. But oh I'm yeah, just, yeah, yeah. But like yeah, fair enough. Am I gonna complain halfway up 
Uh, probably. Aye, but like, aye, I'll get aye, through aye. it. <laughs> Goodness. I was a trooper during Gross Piton. If the walk to I just the sweat trail profusely at Gross Piton. Yes. Because I put on like my like, I put I put on a ton of like uh, sunscreen and stuff because I wasn't sure what the cloud cover would be or in, like all you know the forests and stuff, but also just because we're you know we're going to be outside and that sunscreen is thick. It's like a mineral sunscreen and it always makes me sweat more. So like I was just pouring sweat the entire time and drinking tons of water to keep up with all the sweat that I was losing. So it was, uh, yeah, I just know that that would happen at Petit Piton. All right. So but looking forward to sweating it out on, uh, on another peak. <laughs> yep. As always. <laughs> Anything else you want to say? No, I um I really enjoyed the Gross Piton hike and I think a really cool unique thing about St. Lucia is that there's lots of great hiking opportunities. Um so it's not it's not just an island where you want to just sit on the beach the whole time. I mean, you can if you want to. It certainly has something for everyone, but uh lots of great hiking opportunities if you guys want to get out and actually get inside the island and really explore. Um so yeah. But that is hiking in St. Lucia. Um let us know your thoughts. Have you guys been hiking in St. Lucia? Would you guys be interested in doing that? You can always let us know on Twitter at WW Honeymoon, Instagram at Worldwide Honeymoon, or email cat at WorldwideHoneymoon.com. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget to rate and review our podcast. It takes less than a few minutes and really helps other people find us. Also, if you're enjoying this awesome free information on both the blog and podcast, when you're booking your next trip, head over to WorldwideHoneymoon.com slash resources and use the links provided. We earn a small commission at no cost to you when you book through these links. And these are all brands and companies we know, love, and use, like Skyscanner for finding the best flight prices, World Nomads for the best travel insurance, TripAdvisor for hotel bookings and reviews, and even Amazon for all of your travel purchases. Thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Wherever you are, wherever you go, remember to make every day a worldwide honeymoon.